Good morning, Southside. I'd like to extend a special welcome for anyone who might be visiting with us this morning. We're grateful to have you come worship with us and be a part of our time to praise our God. Uh, We're currently working our way through the book of Romans, so if you will, turn to Romans chapter 9. I love this section of scripture that we are in as Paul's kind of pulling back the curtain of world history and showing us God and his purposes and how he does what he does and why he does what he does. The sovereign one doing as he pleases and only as he pleases. And he's really giving us the reason for all of history. A God perspective on everything that has ever happened on the planet that he created and what will happen. And so this is a big section. It's what we call theocentric. It's God-centered. I think it's the cure for American Christianity that the gospel has just become all about me and, and my history and how it fits into me, and that the self-culture then just flows right into the church, and it has no room for God's design and for his glory, his free sovereign grace that he's going to describe in this section. And it's a plan for the whole world and its completion. And there's just something so beautiful about it that it demands my life, my soul, my all. There's just something bigger than you and your plans. And it's God and his beautiful, amazing reason for creating the universe and where he'll take it all is for his glory at the end of chapter 11. And to think some people are out golfing this morning. We are gonna lay hold of it and I want us to go to the Lord and I wanna pray for Ukraine and those sweet brothers and sisters in Christ who are under great persecution and really the whole the whole nation. I had uh, some friends I went to seminary with, and they planted a seminary in Ukraine 30 years ago, and they have trained 900 local pastors who are in Ukraine expositing the Word of God week in and week out. It's a strong, it's a strong church, and they're, they're not fleeing. They're staying in. They're redeeming this time to preach the gospel, and we need to be lifting them up and praying like never before for our brothers and sisters and all that they're facing in this time. So let's Let's go before our God. Father, we just praise you. You're God, and you're worthy to be worshipped and adored and to offer up bodies, living sacrifices to serve you. And God, we, we think of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are under great suffering right now, under great threat and fear. And I thank you, Lord, that they're drawing near to you. You're such a present God in the time of help. When our foundations are all shaken, you're a strong tower, a refuge. And so I pray that you comfort your people. God, that you protect them, that you help them in this difficult season. I pray for that whole nation and all the suffering that is coming upon it. I pray that you will do mighty things for your glory, your name, how you're unfolding a world, God, to bring us to this glorious climax where you'll be the center of all and only those who love you will dwell in the new heavens and the new earth for all of eternity. So God, that is our hope. That's where we keep setting it. And our hearts just hurt for our dear brothers and sisters. I just pray, God, comfort them and help them during this time. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me give you a bird's eye view of what we're going to be looking at for the next month, at least. (laughs) We're in this morning the thesis of the whole chapter in verse 6, but it's not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. That will be the the heart, and Paul will unpack that statement in the rest of this three-chapter section. So we're going to call it the crux, And then he's going to call three witnesses to come and testify to show that this is always how God has worked salvation. So I'm going to call that the the clarity. And then in verses 14 through 18, there's going to be the complaint is if God uh, saves whom he wills and desires, is that not unjust? And then the next charge will be, you know, we're just clay. You know, how can we argue, you know, God, who can resist his will? How can he find us guilty if he's the one choosing and doing his will? So we'll call that the clay, and then we'll close out in verses 30 through 33, where he's driving this whole chapter to the conclusion 
of, of why Israel's missing the gospel and why the Gentiles were getting it. And it was by faith in this message that we've been studying for the last two years. So technical section, but just beautiful if you will come labor with me. So I hate to tell you this, but I need you to think. I need you to come and wrestle with me in the Word of God, and you're in for a treat. There is just beauty in this chapter. So let's start with the, the crux, the thesis of the chapter. And so just under that, there, there's an accusation that is made um, in verse 6, but it's not as though the Word of God has failed. There's the accusation, as the Word of God failed. Paul's given us a glimpse into his, to, to the heart towards his people. He, he loves Israel, his brethren. He, they, but he said in verses 4 through 5, they had all this privilege. They had covenants. They had the law. They had Jesus come from their very lineage. And they thought all of that privilege that was given to them saved them. And Paul's going to show you that privilege does not save. And so he preaches, just the, the, the children of Abraham thought by circumcision, it brought us into the, the covenant people of God. And because we have Jewish blood, we have the favor of God upon us. So that when the gospel was preached to them, they hated it. And they're trying to kill Paul. They killed Jesus. They killed John the Baptist over it. And most at the time of this writing have rejected their Messiah and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is just carrying this pain in his heart. I wish that I could be condemned, that you could be saved. Just this deep, deep love for his kinsmen according to the flesh. <clears throat> but the crisis ties into our crisis this morning. Why this section is so important, why we should be digging in, is Romans 8, we have eternal security. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God made promises to Israel as well to bless them, and they are now accursed. So how do I know that God can keep the promises he's making to us? How do I have this bold confidence and assurance that we have looked at through Romans 8? There, there can't be a weakness in the chain of grace that we saw in verses 29 through 30 of chapter 8. And that's what he's going to be dealing with. I need a real answer for Israel. I can't bank my eternity and everything on the faithfulness of God when Israel did the same thing and look where it got them. They're sitting here under judgment. Help me, Paul. If the promise failed with the elect nation, how much more a little grafted in branch to the tree Gentiles. And so this is a big deal. I get why the three chapters. And so I want you to catch this. Paul is not writing this because he just likes controversial doctrines. And not so we can argue and debate over it and kill each other throughout church history. <clears throat> Paul sees this as crucial to sustaining our faith, making it strong in the faithfulness of God. And that's what I'm praying for every one of us, that this will make our faith stronger, will be more abandoned, and we can trust these promises of God to where if we lived in Ukraine, we could stay right in there and know if a bomb hits me, I'm going to glory. God will see to it. Have the purposes of God failed? Paul, you came out shooting big guns in chapter 8 to rest in the eternal purposes of God. Now, I need an answer for this. And so let's take it up. There's our accusation. Has the word of God failed with what he said to Israel? And now our next point is the axiom. He gives an axiom in verse 6. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, and that will be the truth that we will unfold in this whole chapter. And so this is big. Have the promises made to Israel just fallen to the ground? Well, the unacceptable answer is yes, they've failed. God's commitment to Israel, that Hebrew word was hesedness, that loyalty, covenantal faithfulness, I will keep my people, I will fulfill the covenant. Has that failed? And the answer is, are you ready? In chapter 9, to show that, no, there's no failure. God's word and purposes and promises have not failed. God remains faithful. And Paul gets his answer by not pulling out a new thought, not something he just came up with. <clears throat> the Old Testament told us that this was how God was going to fulfill his promises made to Israel. In chapters 9 through 11, he quotes 30 Old Testament passages He's just going to go back to your Bibles and say, this is the way it always was. This is God's design. Everything's moving perfect according to plan. Paul goes to the Word of God to show you God's purpose. 
and that it has not failed. All is moving perfect. And the answer, for they are not all Israel who has descended from Israel. And it's a breathtaking statement at that time in history. The promises of God made to Israel are true for Israel. But not all Israel is Israel, Paul says. The promises are true and valid to true Israel, spiritual Israel. The ethnic, fleshly Israel, he's going to say, nope. The promises were made to true Israel, and they haven't failed. Do you see why the Jews hated Paul? He just keeps cooking their grits because he's attacked their whole view of the law, their whole view of salvation. It's by faith and not by works. And if that's not enough, by the way, you're not true Israel by having Jewish blood. True Israel comes from having divine blood washing over your sins. True Israel comes by the way of the promise of how God gets true children. It never was God's purpose to save all of Israel in the Old Testament. Not everyone who's a physical descendant of Abraham is of the spiritual Israel. This is a crucial distinction. I don't care what camp you come from. This is clear as a whistle. Not all Israel is Israel. It opens up a massive part of how we understand the Old Testament. As you read and see things that Israel did, you just cry out and say, how do they do that? How can they be so hard? And the beauty of the new covenant, God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. None will turn away. This is going to look a lot different than what we see of the Israel in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so what Paul is saying then, it was never God's purpose in election to save every Israelite. That was never his intention in the Old Testament. And you're like, come on. Remember when you're a kid and you play sports with your brothers and you lose and you say, I wasn't trying to win anyways. <laughs> Paul, are you, are you just reaching? <laughs> what is this? Well, in Romans 2.28, we've already studied it. Paul said he's not a Jew who's one outwardly. Neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who's one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So what happened? The Jews thought they were spiritual children of God, and they were blessed of God. They have no worries. They're going to inherit eternal life. And now this gospel is rocking them. Listen to Luke 3.8. <clears throat> Therefore, bring forth fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. We're, we're the ones, we're the, we're the true ones. We're the spiritual ones. We, we got all the blessings. He can take stones and raise up children. Quit, our, quit believing that. John 8, 44, to the Jews, you're of your father, the devil. And you wanted to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. So why do we see throughout the book of Acts so many problems with the Jews? They're annoyed at Paul's preaching. This man is preaching as if we're sinners. The Pharisee and the publican praying, you know, the Pharisee's like, I'm such a good boy, I keep the law, I do all of these things. I'm not like this publican here next to me. They're resting in the fact that they were God's chosen nation, and therefore we're all going to heaven. This is a bold statement. You can see why they hated Paul. Just because you're born into the nation of Israel doesn't make you true Israel. The promises of God have never failed in regard to true Israel. Among the elect nation, there's an elect group, and they enjoy all the promises of God that were made to them, Paul being one of them, drinking up the promises of God that were made to Abraham. So what a critical distinction Paul is making here. The rest of this section is to explain and show the answer to this statement. But simply put, not all Israel is Israel. It's a hard one to argue with. Not all Israel is Israel for the promises that God made to them. Israel cannot just look at their birthright as the guarantee of salvation. And that's a big statement, Paul. You better prove it. And so prove it he will. 
and I think it will take your breath away. The answer's left me worshiping all week, so wake up, nudge the person next to you, make sure they're awake. So let's look at it. We have an accusation. The word of God fail with Israel? No, the axiom is that not all Israel's Israel, and now we're going to look at the argument in verses 7 through 13. Has God made a distinction between true Israel versus physical Israel? <clears throat> He's going to call some people to the, to the stage, to the stand. Two sets of witnesses, and they're going to be the patriarchs. And they're going to show that this uh, election began with them and continued to the present day, and not Paul, again, pulling out just a rabbit out of his hat. This is the way God has always purposed to do things, and he starts with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it continues to this very day. This is beautiful. Abraham, he has two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And as we read this morning, chapter 4, Abraham was the supreme example of justification by faith in Christ alone. And in chapter 9, he's going to use Abraham again as the example of this truth about not all Israel is Israel. And it's going to be used twice. He says, not all Israel is Israel. He says, not all descendants are descendants. And so you got a descendant in a natural sense who's a descendant of the flesh, but there's a descendant in the spiritual sense, and that's how the covenant is carried on in this promise. And then he uses twice, there's their children, but there's true children. There's physical children and there's spiritual children. And so Paul's just going to lay this out to show you there's always been a distinction. And that is what we're going to, that is what is going on here with Israel. The physical children missed it. And the physical descendants and physical uh, Israel did not inherit the promised blessings of salvation. They're under the condemnation of God and wrath as Paul is writing this. So let's begin with Abraham. Abraham, how did, how did Abraham come into this promise? And election was very obvious with Abraham. Most people can't argue that. Abraham was born in Ur in Mesopotamia. And his family, in, in Joshua 24 too, his family worshiped idols. This is an idol, a pagan idolater named Abram. And God sought him out, and he called him out. And the Jewish history begins with that election of all the people on the face of the earth. Abram, you're the one. I draw you out. It was God's free choice of Abraham to be the head of his new covenant people that he would bless and bring near to the rest of the Old Testament. So it was not based on anything in him. He's a worshiper of idols. Oh, this is good raw material. It's just, he calls them out. You're the one. You're the one I'm going I'm to draw out and use to establish this nation. Then we come to Isaac. <coughs> Isaac, Paul's going to quote two texts, um, and let's take a look at them. Now we're going to see in Romans 9, 7. So nor are all the children... Nor are, nor are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Who are these true children? <coughs> it's not those of physical descent, <coughs> but the children of God are the children of of the promise. They're his special children. And the way Paul supports this is he starts quoting Genesis 21, 2. And so this is big. I want to set the context to get what's going on here. Labor with me. This is going to be so sweet by the end. In Genesis, Abraham was promised a seed. And through that seed, God would bless his descendants greatly. There's land, great people, abundant blessing. Your descendants will be like the sea, sand on the seashore, the stars. Abraham lived in that land from where the promise was made without children for many years. And it, and it, it, is, it is given in Genesis 15. Again, God says, Abraham, go look at the stars. And as he looks out, he says, so shall your descendants be. And it says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. There's our justification uh, in the promise of God in a seed. But he and Sarah had to live under the pressure of an unfulfilled promise. Have you ever had to do that? It, it, it's dragging on and, and in the promise, and they're getting older and older. Where's this going to come from? So Sarah wanted to put a little hand of help to the promise. Let's fulfill this. 
<coughs> she had an Egyptian maiden named Hagar, and she gives her to Abraham so that they could have a child and that many children then could spring forth in the promise that God had made. Hagar conceives a baby, and he's named Ishmael. Ishmael grows up. The word comes to Abraham, not in this son will the promises I made to you be fulfilled. They're not going to come through Ishmael. Good try, but that's not how I get children. But I will carry out my covenant that I made with you. And then he, he splits the animals in half on that altar, and two parties would walk through and make a covenant. And they, if, if I don't keep it, may I be split in half like this. And only God walks through it. And God says, I'm going to bless you, and I'm the one who's going to do all the requirements to bring about this promise. Abraham doesn't walk through it because God's going to fulfill everything to bring about this blessing. <clears throat> it's not going to be by the son then of your physicality or the son of your work, Ishmael. But it will happen by your barren wife, and she's going to bear a son, and through that son, I'm going to carry out my purpose. Ishmael turns 13, and he's mocking the newborn son, Isaac, the son who was born according to the purpose and promise of God. Any of you have a teenager? This isn't hard to picture. He's making, <laughs> he's making fun of the little kid. And Sarah says to Abraham, get her and her child out of here. The reason the son of their maid will not be an heir with my son, get him out of here. He will not inherit the blessings and the promises Isaac will. And Abraham balks at this. This is my son. And a word comes to Abraham. And we see it in verse 7. Now, nor, they are, nor are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants. And here's the quote now. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. <clears throat> God says, listen to her. Cast him out. For through Isaac, your seed will be named. The Greek word is called. Through Isaac... You're going to get called. And God is saying, I will call my seed out, not through Ishmael. My seed's going to come through the line of Isaac. That's my purpose. That's my promise. And this is powerful because we have taken some time to understand the call of God in Romans 8, the effectual call when you're a dead corpse and God says, let there be life. And you're raised to spiritual life and you believe in Jesus Christ. We use Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. How? How? He needs life to respond to the call of God. So God's call gives life, spiritual life. And the bottom line is God is saying, I will create my line through this one and not that one. It's going to come through Isaac and not through Ishmael. In Genesis 17, God says, I will establish my covenant with him. Both children are Abraham's physical seed, right? But only Isaac is the heir of the promise to receive all the blessings that God had promised through Abraham's seed, singular, which will be Jesus Christ when he comes into this world. <clears throat> so right away, guys, there's a distinction to whom the blessings come. Isaac and Ishmael, it'll be through Isaac that true Israel will come. That spiritual Israel will spring forth from Isaac. This is God's declaration. And so now here is what Paul does. In verse 8 is an apostolic commentary to Genesis 21. In Genesis 21, 12, God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac, your descendants shall be named or called, Romans 9, 7. So not the children of the flesh, the physical descendants of Abraham. But the children of God are those in relationship with him, his favor, his protection, and his love. And those are the ones who can anticipate the coming blessings of God in the new heavens and the new earth to be joint heirs with Christ. Back to Romans 8, 15 through 17. So my question is, who are those children of God? Who are the children of promise? The ones who receive the seed that will come and Jesus Christ will be the seed who will come into this world, and in him will be salvation. The ones who believe God, that he will bless the nations through that one, Jesus Christ. Those are the true spiritual seeds. And so get this. Not every ethnic Israelite is a child of God. 
Ishmael was according to the flesh, and Isaac was according to promise. And now Paul's going to explain that in verse 9. For this is the word of the promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. This is the word of promise. So how did Isaac become a child of the promise? Did it come by physical means? Not a chance. Have you ever asked yourself, is it just a cool story? Why did God wait till Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90? So you could be like, wow, that's amazing. She's barren her whole life. The promise was a child born by the supernatural work of God. There's no other explanation for this baby. His birth could never be by natural means. It could only be a supernatural birth. God says here, according to promise. According to God's promise, right? It will come through a son that I will give you Abraham. And the child of promise was the one who God himself made. God created this baby, not man. That's why he waits to 190 You can't make a baby at that age. They're barren their whole lives. God wants you to see he's the one. The promise is for those who are affected by the promise of God. The promise of God, you'll have a son, a supernatural son. You will will receive the promise, Abraham. Believe God through the supernatural intervention of God himself. God will make a child. Very much like, unless you're born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. You can't fix your, you can't make yourself saved. You can't make yourself a spiritual seed. You can't, you can't do it. God has to give birth to his children. That's what he's telling you here in Romans 9. It's powerful. His very existence comes out of the promise of God. In other words, there's a word of promise At this time, a year from now, Genesis 18, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Why is that? Because God has determined that his promise will come from him and will go to whom he desires. It's astonishing what is being said here. And I want you to listen, please. Inheriting the promise of blessing in the seed is not based on physical birth alone but depends on God's own intervention and his calling you to life spiritually. Isaac is born of a direct act and effect of the promise of God. And Paul's conclusion is God's promise then is faithful. As he works his promise, it is effectual. The promise of a blessing passed on, God himself determines who will be the objects of that blessing. It's all the work of God to the one who believes Abraham, the father of our faith. God fulfills his promise, and it does not fail. That's why Paul is writing this letter. The distinction that is here, not all Israel is Israel. Not all physical children are spiritual children. And not all descendants are descendants. What accounts for the distinction? Grace and not race. The promise is being fulfilled. Inheriting the promise of God is not universal to the Jewish nation. It's not by physical connection to Abraham, but connection to who? To Christ. Supernaturally through God himself, who is determined through whom he himself will choose and thus called a spiritual life. Who will respond with the faith of Abraham? The ones that God calls to life. And when he calls to life, they're the ones who will believe the message of Jesus Christ. The seed who lived and died in your place is the ultimate seed of promise. And oh my, all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. So how do we get united to that seed to inherit the promises of God? By the faith of Abraham. And I want you to hear this, that faith comes by a supernatural work of God. That's how he gets children, by the promise. He makes alive 
And the first breath of that life is faith. God gets children by himself, not by the works of the flesh. Do you hear that? Dare I say that your free will as the sovereign determiner of your eternal life is much like Ishmael. It's trying to get children by your own flesh. And it's trying to get children by what you do, what the Jews were doing, by their works. God is the one who brings life, and he brings children into the promise by grace and not by works. Flip over to Galatians 4. This is breathtaking. In Romans 3.29, he said, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. <clears throat> Galatians 4.21. Tell me, you who want to be under law, Jews, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons. That's what we're talking about this morning. One by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. We just looked at that. But the son by the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born what? According to the flesh, their own will, their own attempts to fulfill God's promise, to get children. And the son by the free woman came through the promise. Abraham, I'll give you a child. 100 years, 90 years old, I'll bring it about. And this is allegorically speaking. Just pull out right now all those stories you're reading in history. God's saying, I'm painting an allegory. Don't miss what I was doing in, in that Old Testament in Genesis. This allegory, this allegorically speaking for these women are two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She's Hagar. All those under the law trying to get right with God, allegorically speaking. Ishmael is all who try to get right with God by their own works and their own attempts and their own efforts, their own wisdom. <laughs> now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she's in slavery with her children. And that slavery at the end of Romans 9 is she's trying to get right through works. Verse 26 but the Jerusalem above is free. She's our mother, Sarah. For it is written, rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Ishmael was persecuting Isaac as a picture of what's to come. So it is now. They're just persecuting Christians who preach free grace, and the little legalists are coming at you and attacking you. He's saying that's, that's the, been this allegory from all of history. But what does it, as the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Get rid of them. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. You'll never get right with God by law. Cast it out. You'll never get there through your own works. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. We've been born and called by God, and we look to Jesus Christ alone as our only hope of salvation. We've been called into life by God, by being poor in spirit and no longer looking to your own works, your own efforts, but looking to the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. That is the sovereign election of God. Through Isaac and not Ishmael will come the blessing. And so now we need to call our next set of witnesses to the stand. And here's where Paul's at his best, because your argument could be this. Well, sure, God chose Isaac and not Ishmael. Ishmael was not a pure-blooded Jew. He was the son of Agar, who was an Egyptian slave. That's why he was chosen. Well, next week, I'm going to make you wait till next week. I hate this. <laughs> Rebecca and Isaac have two sons. They're twins from the same father, 
and same mother. They're in the womb. So consider what you have there. Twins born of the same Jewish parents, Hebrews of Hebrews. They could not have been chosen on the basis of better ancestry. But in the twin, their twins, their, their womb mates. And that was bad. <laughs> and listen to this. Esau was born first and then Jacob. So Esau should have got the blessing. So what was normal, the elder one should have received the greater blessing. And we're going to see by the free sovereign grace of God, he says, this is the one I'm going to bless. My seed is going to work through Jacob. And so God's purposes and his choice are what make him God. And he's going to get children by his choice, not by yours. And it brings you to your knees at the feet of a God who we completely are dependent on and who saves and will get children that way. And the way you know is if you have faith in Jesus Christ alone and have come to him for this great salvation. So that's next week. Come back. <laughs> to close out, there's so many thoughts through my head. But I think this section makes the gospel even sweeter to my own heart. I didn't think it could get any better than Romans 8. But there's more to be treasured and loved and trusted in and delighted in this morning. The reason that I stand in that grace and the favor of God that we've been learning about for two years, why his goodness and love and kindness will pursue after me all of my days is what made me differ than any other human on this earth. I once hated Christ. I thought I loved him, but I hated him. I persecuted Christians. And now he means more to me than my own wife and my own children. It's dwarfed in the light of his glory and grace. I come from a family of seven boys, and I have two brothers set under the same teaching, the same parents. We went to the same schools and they see more value in a football team or a good dirty joke than Jesus Christ. And they still think that God gets children by Ishmael, by works, being good guys, and working hard at it. And yet they're both more intelligent. They were better morally. And they had way more going for them than I ever did. And it wasn't that I was more pliable. It wasn't that God looked down the corridors of time. All he would have saw was a punk. And it wasn't that I figured it out and they didn't. It was that the grace of God invaded my life. And he put me on my face. And he showed me what I was before God and all my good works were filthy rags. And I lost any hope in my good scale theology that my good deeds would outweigh the bad. And I fled to Jesus Christ alone, who by infinite grace emptied himself and went on a cross. He bore my gift and he died in my place for my sins when I wasn't even alive. God gets children by free sovereign grace. His promises and his purposes will never fail. I pray that you get up every day and preach that to yourself. The miracle that God has caused your heart to trust in a Messiah where millions are perishing right around you and see no value in Jesus Christ, to be a child of promise and a joint heir with Christ it's by the free grace of God, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh. How do I know if I'm God's elect? Because Israel rejected the cornerstone. And they killed him. They hated him. And John says that he came to his own and his own rejected him. But to those who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so the way I know if I'm a children of Isaac that I've been called is because I, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I see value in him and I'm losing my life for that king. I believe in the finished work of what he's done. 
And so that's where we go. We don't go to looking at the eternal book. Is, your, is my name written in it? God doesn't let us look in that. He lets us look at Jesus Christ crucified in our place. And we believe in him and we call upon him. And those are the ones who have been called by God. Amen. Unbelievable how God gets children. Hmm. Let me pray. You got me all fired up, man. Father, I pray that every soul in this room can't get over that by Ishmael, they would have never got right with you by their free will, by their trying to merit and clean themselves up and use religion to be moral. God, that would have damned us. And many of us walked in those shoes. And God, it is only by grace that you invaded us. And you get children from 100-year-olds and 90-year-olds. You bring forth children by your will, your purpose, your word. And you cause us to be born again. And our first response, like a baby grasping a finger, is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, God, you will get all the glory for salvation. Salvation belongs to our God. And we will never pat ourselves on the back because we were smarter and we figured it out. We will forever praise you because you sought me while a stranger wandering from the fold of God. So to God be the glory and may you be worshiped and praised by every believing heart here this morning. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray.